Hi, I'm Mel Buchanan. I'm the curator of Decorative Arts and Design at the New Orleans Museum of Art. And I'm so excited to be here today um, with a special interview with Jeffrey Mann. Uh, Jeffrey is a Scottish artist, designer, and a senior lecturer at the Manchester School of Art. And we at NOMA worked with him uh, three years ago for a special commission work of art. Uh, so Jeffrey, thanks for being here today. Uh, thank you for inviting me, Mel. Um, well, before I think we're going to be looking at a lot of your artwork today on the screen as we build a way up to talk about the second line, um, a commission you did um, for New Orleans. But before we get there, can you just tell us a little bit about, um, you know, the, the brief biography? How did you get to your um, position where you are now? Um, I, I've always been working with materials throughout my academic life. I was trained in three-dimensional design. So I was a jack of all trades and not really a master of any of them at that point. But one thing I always became very good at was, was I was good with technology. I understood computers. I understood how to manipulate them and coerce them into how I wanted them to think rather than them thinking for me. So I graduated from the Royal College of Art in 2005. And that was my opportunity to immerse myself with some most fantastic makers and hands-on practitioners but I was the I was the kid in the corner with a computer and not getting dirty. So I kind of approached a lot of the my projects very differently. And I ended up understanding that computer is just a tool, the same way as a hammer or a thrower's wheel or a blower's pipe, that it's useless without the person, without the narrator. Um, so that's where my practice really came from. And well, that that really jumps us beautifully into kind of maybe looking at the first artwork that I, I saw of yours. Um, and I think that the idea is like the computer is useless without the person, the brain, but it's also the emotion. I mean, that's going to kind of, I think, be a lovely theme that I like to follow through your work. You're using these tools that could be perceived as a cold. Um, so we're talking about 3D printing, um, CNC milling, um, a digital design, but you embed it with such heart and sentiment um, that you know that's that's what drew me to your work. So I'm going to do screen share, and we'll okay. pull up. Um, let's see if I can do this. There we go. Share, and get this slideshow. There we go. So um, this is a work called Shine, and I was walking through a museum in New York, the Museum of Art and Design, and they had an exhibition about artworks um, that are kind of making. Uh, taking advantage of new digital technologies. This would have been about 2014. And this was this work was my takeaway from the whole show, um, Your Shine of 2005. Can you tell us a little bit more about Shine? Yeah, so Shine was, it's one of these projects which was uh, a labor of love. So I first, I first started working with this notion of capturing the invisible um, in 2003, 2004 where I was really interested in trying to um, capture reflection. I think one thing to remember before this is that um, everything I do is because of a narrative or a challenge or an exploration or a question. I don't find technology and try and shoehorn it into a project. What I like to do is make sure it's, it's fit for purpose. I always believe if you can make it by a, with your hands, make it with your hands. Don't let technology be a shortcut in that sense. Mm -hmm. So with Shine, what it was about, um, in London there's a portable market and it's filled with lots of reflective objects, but lots of objects that you don't really require anymore. It's like there was 20th century um, kind of, um, of candelabras, there's like cr um, silver plates, it's kind of platter, things that don't really fit into my home life. But I was attracted to it like a magpie, but I didn't know why. So I looked into it further, and it was similar to very uh, original cartoons where you used to crosshatch a particular highlight. So you used to get this lovely kind of like, and people, that would be what would be the reflection, that, that would show someone that was a metallic surface. So yeah. I wanted to see if I could find what that was. So I ended up using a 3D scanner, but ironically I had to use a very, well, old and terrible 3D scanner that, didn't, wasn't very intelligent. So it was almost dumb technology because I needed this machine to see exactly what existed, not what it knew I wanted to see. Is this, this image just, yeah. This is one of the original ones. This is the original 3D print. So the 3D print, as the scanner went past, it shot this kind of, uh, this laser, very short thrower laser, and it 
hit the reflective surface and bounce back. So these particular highlights, what the spikes are, what they are is materialized reflection. And that's when it gets a bit interesting because in 3D scanning, in the 3D scanning business, which does exist, there's people that used to de-spike objects. They would be, they'd do, a, they'd be laboriously removing these blemishes. Of removing the things that aren't on the original candelabra that the computer is reading as yeah. a reflection and the computer doesn't know what to make of it. Got it. But what I find interesting with that is, and this is where a lot of my work comes from is, just because we can't see something doesn't mean it exists. And, and, doesn't mean it, and, and that's what we only, a lot of the work you'll see right. later on uses, we, we still only see 12 streams per second. Now this, what if we didn't learn that objects reflection wasn't a real material? Mm -hmm. So what happened through the 3D scan, you had these amazing spikes and this was 3D printed. The candelabra existed because it needed a presence, needed a founding object. But this was the least, it was the most digitally produced object that had the least digitally aesthetic, which I think a lot of people were kind of like, I don't actually, is, is this, is this a, they're like, is it a mistake? Is it wrong? What is this? Right? Yeah. What is the object? How it was made, how it was designed, all these things were pushing a lot of different disciplines I had to work with to create the object. Eventually, uh, it, it came back again in 2010 when um, Max Fraser, a London curator, asked me to create a piece of the Craft Council for um, uh, Labcraft. And at that point, I didn't want to make a 3D printer. I didn't want to show the 3D printed object because I'm, I always believe in the parent material should be, that's where it gets interesting. When it's this a tool to get you to the final product. Yeah. Well, it's a tool, but then that aesthetic could never be made without technology. And... Yeah. The silver and bronze could never have been challenged without using that technology. So this ended up being bronze plated, a very, very long piece, a uh, place to piece. The other thing that really interests me in this project and going away from technology is that it's an object that ended up in three collections, in a craft collection, an art collection, and a design collection. It became this transdisciplinary object that because nobody could fit it into one mold, it became them all. Yeah. And I think that is what was, that's for me, it was, it drew my, it brought my love back for the object itself. But it's a digitally created, it's the rawest digital object I'll ever make. I have no, my hands do not touch this piece apart from literally lifting it out of machines. <laughs> yeah. Well, I love, I mean, and it's, if anyone walking up to it, in, you know, in a case in a gallery has questions about it, I love the simplicity of the title, Shine. That was the thing to me who's new to your work when I saw it, it's like, shine of course this is an object about capturing shine and that's where you're using this digital technology tool to to capture something um do you mind if i move ahead to the to the next yeah, work? yeah of course please do um but then you uh, around the same time you were working through this series which is found in many many, many museum collections um and it's equally well even more elegant if possible um but you're again you're capturing something that doesn't exist to the eye but but, but is it more about time, capturing time and motion? Yeah. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about um, the Attracted to Light lamp series? Yeah, so this, uh, that you mentioned time. Time's a, a thing that is a constant theme throughout my whole practice as a studio. Even with the candelabra, it's that moment in time. I caught that reflection, that one point with the, the moth, this piece was, it came from a long exposure series. Um, I was interested in, I suppose the un, yeah, there we go. That's exactly, there's my face, <laughs> so on my back of my head. Um, I was interested in the unfamiliar familiarity of objects or experiences. Uh, in Scotland, uh, we, have, um, we have midges, very small, annoying insects that bite you, um, especially if you're camping or you're outside in a caravan or Whatever, just mosquitoes. You might call them here. Yeah. Kind of like mosquitoes, not as annoying. Well, more annoying mosquitoes. Very oh. small, tiny little things, horrible things. Um, but when they bite you, they bite. Anyway, but they all attract to light. They have the same thing that all these animals, moths and things. They go to light and they create this amazing swarm around the object. Now they fly so fast. Again, our eye only sees twelve frames per second, so we don't see everything that's happening. So I was interested in, well, what am I missing? What am I not seeing? Where there is a beauty that 
that lives above and beyond our own material world. It's just we can't see it yet. So what I ended up doing is working with uh, with moths because a larger object, and obviously they have that connection to. Well, mm -hmm. they, they think they think uh, a lamp is the moon. They think they're flying back to the moon, hence why they do this. Um, I was interested in being able to try and capture the movement. I was interested. I was interested in um, narrating the rationale of the movement rather than it's a moth flying. Um, so what I ended up doing is using a moth in a motion capture environment where I could capture exactly how the moth flew around this one central source. And so that um, means the center that, image we're seeing here is kind of a... a yeah, the, the, the center, the, and then from that trajectory, then it's been aligned with um, the profiles of that point of the moth flying as well. And then you have to skin it. And that sounds a bit weird. You have to, you almost start using these very human or human vocabulary within a digital realm. So I have to skin this object and give it some volume. Because yeah. it's just it's just a lot of points. There's, there's millions of points and polygons at that point. Um, but oh, what's interesting, okay. yeah, well, what's interesting, although I work on a computer in a sense, as you can see, I don't, I have no control of what these animals do. And it can be quite annoying because it is a light. So I have to try and put a light in it and all these different things happen. But then you, what you end up getting this is a beautiful, almost ephemeral object that is veiling itself through through air, as you can see in this piece. Yeah. Um, and though it is, it is a, it's a hanging sculpture in that sense because the lamp is, you can kind of see it from the angle of the main body. It kind of comes in like conical. But you don't yeah. see that. You can just see where the edges of the moth is hitting the side. So the moth is defining space. Yeah. I, I always like the idea. Of, I was thinking of the John Martin um, song "Solid Air," and I love this premise of solid air. Actually, what if our air is solid? There's one slight change, and it could be. And this moth is carving its path through, and creating. This is the object that's created from it. It's leaving a, a constant echo. A solid echo is a lovely kind of thing to think about as well. So this was. Uh, this stayed in 3D printing. This stayed in a uh, polymer nylon because that, the material itself has a slightly uh, powderous surface, which is very, very, um, I suppose, similar to a moth. A moth wings itself. Yeah. It yeah. also is slightly, which, um, it's not translucent, but it has a, a you know, it's, it seems like an appropriate, it, um, it glows a little bit. Um, the, yeah, there is a translucency on the thinness of the object as well. Yeah. Um, and this is, this piece kind of was one of the first that I did create, but I was working on so many different subject matters at the same time. And it just happened that each one required me to use a different technology at this point as well. Well, um, that might be a, a next link into the next kind of major body of work using different types of technology because, or different types of media. The work for Noma is actually, it's a glass paired with a video. Um, and it's similar to this body of work, uh, cross fire, which, um, you know, the, the artwork, you know, is, is a video from which the, or an, of a digital animation from which the 3D objects are derived. Um, hmm. so you want to tell us a little bit about um, uh, Crossfire in, in, the, in the American beauty scene? Yeah, so Crossfire, well, it, it became, I'm very, anim when I speak, I use my hands, I animate, I kind of, I try and project my voice. When you're lecturing, you have to project and direct your voice. So I was interested in audio, audio as a deformer. We've all been in some sort of club or been in, a, in a, uh, an opera where, where the sound takes over your body, and resonates yeah. inside you and gives you these emotions. But it's sound, it's not, it's, it's not, it's intangible. It doesn't, it's not physically doing anything. There's no physicality apart from these vibrations, all these different octaves. And I was interested, what, what would happen if, and again, if is a great part, what if, I always say if a lot of when I do work, what if sound was a deformer? What if audio was something that could have a direct impact on objects that it surrounds itself every day? Mm -hmm. And I, I worked there, I worked with a, a very close friend of mine, Chris LeBron in this work, who he helped animate the object and we figured out how to do it at this point. Um, the animation became a driver for it because uh, all my work has animations and sketches. That's how I sketch, that's how I create the work. 
but what was interesting is that is I usually I throw them away. I don't show them. They're never exhibited. But this piece really, you needed one from the other. And this was initially uh, created as a part of a commission for University of Dundee, which is past, present, future craft practice um, study they were doing. And I created this body of work. I was really interested, okay, if I shouted at an object and created directional sound, how could you create an object that would deform, but not in, not in a digital graphic equalizer way, kind of like, old school kind of jumping around MTV 1980s style logo jumping around. I was interested in adding new parameters to deformers such as gender, such as anger, such as so it would actually pick up a different form. From that point we kind of then looked at well if this is bone china that will move very differently to glass and glass would move very differently to silver and things had to just like that would have to slightly change you can kind of see there from this image you've got a bowl which is massive kind of almost growth coming out from it but you yeah. always see when, when i do choose because obviously from animation i can pause at any point and i create artifacts from the art from the sound um these artifacts i always keep uh, a little tip to the original i always have this object so you still know what it is so it's not so blob morphic um, the other, the other point of it, I was doing so a lot still of needs just, to look like a fork. It still needs to look yeah, like it still needs to, yeah. it still needs to, it still needs to be a, a clue, yeah. a visual clue to what it is. Um, I'm not challenging people on, on the archetypes. I'm challenging on the materiality of the object. So then I came, then I was figuring out what I was going to use. So I ended up using um, American Music by Sam Mendes of, because I wanted a domestic scene. I, I looked through lots of different things, but the domestic scene was the one that we all have it. We've yeah. all sat at a dinner table with family, with friends, with with kids. Yeah. There's with always happy a noises argument. or yeah. in the case of this particular scene in American Beauty, so much anger um, and in an emotion um, coming out of those very talented actors that's you see the objects, the wine glass, like it's to me, they're almost like shuddering in, in pain, um, which it's a hard piece in that way. You know, kind of maybe remember like being a kid or being at an awkward situation where people are arguing at a table and you, you feel it physically. Um, and that's something that connected me to this work. Like, you know, I'm a, I'm an objects curator. I have emotional connections to forks and spoons and knives. I, I think about objects in that way, but like to me, and I don't know if this is what you meant, but does the wine glass have a relationship with me because of the energy and the sound waves I'm putting out into this world as well? Um, that, that's what kind of attracted me to this work. Um, yeah, I think the wine glass is an interesting object because it's an incredibly intimate object. It's one of the, it, it goes onto our lips. It spends that moment in time with us. You, have, you spend, you have a moment with a wine glass. You could be smelling the aroma. You could be just that that sensation on the lips itself. The moment you connect, it has an emotion. You you it has a connection for it. And I think with this is with this argument was resonating from all three different angles. Is that um, where if I was getting shouted at, I could hide. This this object that's got a connection with me, I can't do anything for it. It can't hide. And I wanted to bring. Uh, almost my feelings um, and that's why I've removed when the animation goes on you do hear the original soundtrack from American Beauty but the characters aren't in it I did direct it the same I followed the same pans which worked really well obviously Sam Mendes is a stage performer director originally a theatre and he beautifully frames scenes and it, it works I, I tried so many different direct changes and direct, uh, camera cuts and it was terrible mm -hmm. I was like, why am I changing that part of it? Um, Let the Sam Mendes blocking be your blocking. The, the, yeah, the blocking. So there is similar kind of like, there is kind of close up just to kind of show the details of the objects. But it was important to show how this argument and also the pace of the argument as well. Mm -hmm. um, you, I needed that anger and that frustration and that hatred coming from the characters from it. And then at the end of it, the frustration from the daughter just kind of going, oh, I've had enough. That's it. And it just all, and at that one point, there's a crescendo, it builds up, it builds up, it builds up. And at one point, everyone speaks and it just crashes in the middle. Mm 
Yeah. And that's what you can almost see every single piece just not just relaxing, just exhaling and going, having to kind of, I suppose, get healed again. Having um, they need they need time as well. So the objects are at the end. Yeah. yeah, a moment to themselves. So yeah, so this piece ended up getting shown. It was it was shown at MoMA actually. Um, at, not designed the elastic mind. That was the other piece. Uh, uh, Talk to me exhibition. And as she first came into MoMA, where the thing is, it, it was the, one of the first pieces. And what was interesting about it is that again, this was the connection between animation and real objects. Yeah. Because the real objects looked so similar, almost identical to the animation. Everyone thought it would stop for him. They didn't think it was animated, an uh, animated piece, because they're like, well, there's so much life and real. Like, there's realness to this animation, there's feelings in it. These have to be, this has to be stopped for him. And I was like, I don't have 6,000 teapots. I've got one. <laughs> it's like, and it was one of these kind of realizations to myself. I never even thought people thought it would stop for him. So, yeah. so uh, Crossfire was an interesting one. Well, and um, well, I that's think what led me to the next part, yeah. Yeah, and so a lot of, you know, these ideas, you know, I saw this work and I was trying to build up um, a piece of contemporary glass for the Noma collection that spoke to new technology, but wasn't cold, that had emotion. And I saw this, I'm like, oh, phenomenal. And, you know, a little behind the scenes, there was actually, it was a, a decanter set with wine glasses that was part of the Crossfire series um, yeah. that I was hoping to bring to Noma, but... I, I was also um, expecting my first child and the, the going on to maternity leave, I missed it because it was so popular. Another museum scooped it up, but that was okay. It was a, it was a great problem to have because in, in, in speaking with you and, and, um, and through your gallery learning that you were actually interested in doing commission work. And that's something we at NOMA are interested in, in as well because we live in such a special place here in New Orleans. So having the opportunity to engage um, this kind of new way of thinking about objects and materials combined with this historically rich city, what would that look like? Um, so that brings us to, um, to this commission, the, the Second Line Cocktail Service of 2017 work that's in the Noma collection, um, which has the animation video, which is not in this presentation for this talk today, but for anyone listening, we, we have it on the Noma website and we do an exploration of this artwork um, through Google Art and Culture. So if you want to see all of the pieces come together, um, it's best in the gallery, but there's a great opportunity to do it online. But then jumping back a bit, um, yeah. Well, do you want to introduce um, the second line in, your, the, in the New Orleans story? Um, yeah, and I think, so I was, I was, how it shifted from Crossfire, I think is an important point as well. Crossfire was other people's words other people's kind of setting, other people's kind of stage. And where that was, was exciting, how it could resonate with someone else, use someone else's work. I was interested in how I could create more an ethnographical piece, a piece that was more relating to an environment, an area. But I, I, that, it was one of these places, that nothing had ever come up to me because it had to be a rich of culture, but there had to be this transcendence between object and material and heart and soul, all these different aspects of it. So when obviously this commission came up from yourself, obviously never gonna say no, and it was a fantastic opportunity. So I'd never been to New Orleans. My, my understanding of New Orleans was very um, stereotypical archetype. I'd seen it on television and, and it, it, was a very, <laughs> yeah, it was a very poor understanding of New Orleans. Um, so obviously we, I, I had to come over. So when I came over, I, ha, I didn't, I planned where I should walk. There's about walking rather than visiting. I, I, I didn't want to be a tourist. I just wanted to observe. I wanted to kind of, uh, the happy accident. Serendipity was working for me in a sense. I just wanted to stumble across things and try and figure things out in my head of why New Orleans and, why I was there and to be honest for a couple of days nothing was happening for me because uh, I, I I think I didn't really know what I was looking at but I think I was still kind of, kind of consuming New Orleans consuming what was going on and consuming and also and also removing myself from what I thought New Orleans was mm -hmm. and what happened on 
I was walking around, it was quite late at night, I can't remember, I think it was something like half past 11, 12 o'clock, there we go. Uh, I was standing on the corner of Frenchman and I was listening to this phenomenal uh, young jazz band. Um, in the same way as a lot of people were, I started kind of understanding it, trying, looking at it a bit further and I was looking at the ages of the uh, ages and the gender and everything of these amazing, amazing musicians. I was just like, this is something different. There's a passion, there's a love here, there's something here. So then I, I kind of uh, walked over and I, there was a gentleman named Aaron Blanks who was selling t-shirts for the band. He was raising money for uh, the community of Treme. Uh, and Aaron just happened to be uh, the grand marshal of, uh, of this band, but also one of the main, major uh, jazz bands in New Orleans. And Aaron was just a phenomenal, phenomenal character. And what came across is this was his life it wasn't just the music it wasn't just the uh, working with these young um young musicians it was also the instruments is what the instruments gave to these these uh musicians and these guys as well and this is what we had this really really just completely off the cuff on uh scripted chat there's no the best way of saying we just we just talk we'll talk for about five minutes um and I, I still, it still lives with me now, his passion for what we was talking about. And he ended up talking about what this was about. And he was talking about, there's a line here within, within the animation of what he said here. He said, the first line uh, comes from the heart and the second line comes from the soul. And that stuck with me. The second line, this is, you're born with it. It's in you, you live for it. It keeps you, and he discusses, it keeps you uh, out of trouble, keeps you out of jail, it keeps you on the right side because this instrument, this material, this brass becomes a currency, becomes uh, something that you strive to keep and strive to have, but you deserve to have it as well. And this just, this was it. It, it went past, as you said, Bourbon Street. It went past uh, everything, almost past Mardi Gras, past everything. This was, this is a transcendent experience of this is material and culture and uh, life and environment and um, focused in history yeah, history and especially because it focused around uh the trimmy community as well so this is where the second line kind of came from it was embedded within the more classical animation of um the cocktail service right. this was a very um because i felt i had i had to embody it back again and i went through so many different variations of a backdrop of a bar uh to um almost it's, it's, but it was too busy too much it had to be honest and clean mm -hmm. and there is little, little kind of um within animation there's two kind of bottles at the bottom of absinthe and all these little kind of little touches the go cup the margarita glass the <laughs> cocktail all these little kind of touches but what was important for me is that the glasses are nothing about the cocktail shaker this is the main point almost the lighthouse within the object the epicenter for a lot of the stages as it cuts the cameras and this is the one piece it's got that is got this amazing brass element, brass top and lid to the object as well. Because I wanted this to be the focus of everything. This is the one that's, okay, this, this is what it's about. It's not just about, these aren't just about cocktail glasses. The this brass is, is referencing the, the music as well. Yeah, the, the, the music so also. The, right. And when you see with the work in, in person, the music is always Part of it. It's different when you look at it in a still image like this, but in the gallery, when you're in person, you have the objects there that, and then the video. But the video is your conversation, but in the background, you're on Frenchman Street in New Orleans. Of course, there's jazz music playing behind you. So you have these punctuations of a pops of, of trumpets kind of coming in um, and that make the objects dance. So I, I've always loved how it blends. Um, Kind of three critical things to me about new orleans the music the, co the rich cocktail culture but meeting people and you have conversations in this unscripted encounter um if you go out into new orleans and just let yourself have no plan and and follow a spirit you're going to connect with someone um and to me that's what you've managed to capture and maybe only an outsider um coming from scotland maybe an only an outsider could um could uniquely see this moment and with your own personal reaction to it um that's what i've always found really really beautiful about it um you, you mentioned the go cup and i'll let you get back but 
I uh -huh. love how even your four short days in New Orleans, you picked up on two local traditions. Um, so we had, you know, in this commission, we were supposed to get the, the cocktail shaker, the martini glass, the wine glass, the margarita glass, the hurricane glass, and the champagne coupe. But when we opened it up, there was lanyap. And New Orleanians, you know what a lanyap is. That's when someone throws in a little something extra. So you order a burger and fries, and as a lanyap, you might get a chicken nugget. That example, but you throw in something extra. So Jeffrey noticed that we got lanyap, so he threw in the lanyap of a go cup something else that's unique to the culture here in New Orleans. A, a go cup is a little plastic cup at the, at the bar, um, at the door. So when you're ready to go, cause you can take your drinks out into the street. Um, you can pour your glass into the go cup and go about um, and into the night. So um, I just love that you tied all of those little cultural things in here together. For me, it, it also, the go cup became, again, it was currency because people collect them, people swap them, people, it's the, the thing to have, it's a symbol as well. So I think putting it in this uh, Boris like a glass, making it a static object, this, this object that is not just precious because of material, precious because of what it represents, it had to be there. It probably would never, it'd never sit on a, a, on a uh, cocktail service tray like that ever again but i think it just yeah. had to have that presence it's, it's hard for me not to get up right thing. now from my seat and go to my kitchen <laughs> and grab stacks of go cups that i have um and it's still but they remind me of a time i took my parents to a barbecue restaurant we got a go cup and i have it or of course mardi gras floats and parades you know they throw them and, and you have them from all the different parades or um children's birthday parties i have a, a friend yeah. who's for kids birthday parties they make go cups and they mean something to me. You're right. They're currency. And um, you know, also until you said that, I never realized how almost emotionally attached I am to these cheap plastic cups that are in my kitchen. But. And, and, and that's what's interesting because if you go, if you exactly that, if it's a cheap plastic cup, it it goes. That's just what the object is, not what the object stands for. And I think that goes back to the 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 instruments. The, the it's a trumpet, it's a trombone, it's it's all these it's different types, but it's brass. It's a brass instrument. That material of brass that isn't just brass instrument. It's a brass band. It's a brass community. It's it goes across. It transcends a lot of things. The go cup transcends everyone. You can go into any you you can go into any bar with this one cup. It allows you in. And I thought it was a really interesting little. Uh, like MacGuffin in the project. There's a little MacGuffin, which is kind of something that you didn't really know why it's there, but it actually it leads as a gateway object for everything else. Yeah, it, and, and I mean, and for your work at all, I mean, I think this whole conversation is always tying back to um, not sentience of the object. It was something, there, but it's like, it's capturing like complex human emotions of connection that happen in a moment um, in, in an object. and. Yeah, yeah, the go cup in the brass and it all weaves together beautifully. Yeah, I think, I think we, we, we stop, we don't take enough time to just observe and remember. We, uh, mobile phones can take a thousand images in 15 seconds, but we don't we really look at them again, do we? So I was kind of interested in how can I capture this moment? I, I, hopefully I will come back to New Orleans again, but I knew at that one point, I, I may never see Aaron again. And I had spoken to other people, but I just, it, it felt too much like, hi, I'm Jeff, I'm from Scotland. And it didn't reply. I just spoke to Aaron as if I'd known him for years. And he, he was so welcoming and he was so passionate and he wanted me to know everything about. And that kind of, that isn't something that comes from someone who isn't true, isn't real, isn't isn't there and that was kind of the important thing for me so this was about capturing him and it's this the whole thing about intangible cultural heritage is important because you can't really make a person intangible cultural heritage i think aaron is i think if you could make someone and hopefully this object becomes that this object and you don't want to say this but goes past aaron's life and continues him as a soul uh, as a as, as a figure within that community as well. Yeah. Um, well, that's kind of a, a beautiful, I had, we had maybe planned to talk a little bit more about the, the technical side of making, but um, 
and maybe that's the telling of like why I'm so interested in you as an artist. Like you, you, you work with all of these engaging new ways of making, but like it's really for all good artwork, it comes down to like the, the feelings that we have is really the more important driving force than the molds and in the printing and, and all of that, which is incredibly interesting as well. Um, but I guess I'll give you, do, do you want to mention anything about the making process or um, just kind of leave it yeah. at this statement? I have to do it very quickly. It's one of these things that there's a lot of, there's many better makers out there than me. And that was one of the biggest things I had to kind of discover about myself when I graduated Royal College is that there is a lot of better makers than I am, but I have to come at it a different approach. So I do, I work across different technologies and I'm not known as a glass artist, though I've ran glass courses, but I've done ceramics and silver and bronze and 3D. I've worked around a lot of different materials. Um, but that, like you said, that humanizing of it is important. So even within, I try and demystify the process as well. So you can see if I've been 3D printing object, the molds and the, the, the third image there, um, even the molds are beautiful objects. Yeah. I kind of stop and reflect a lot on the processes. I don't just make and make and make. Just because I make each part of a process is part of the journey that continues on as well. Um, working across the, the, I think with with the second line, the important part was the brass the brass piece, and that was a really unique object because it was three D printed. But then we, because it's plastic, um, I, I looked around. I was trying to work with um, some metal smiths who, who could raise this object into a beautiful, but they couldn't have it. There'd be too much of their hands and their imprint on the object so it had to be pure for Aaron's voice so we ended up using a very unique um, technology that's usually only used within um, kind of NASA use it a lot for actually because creating lightweight metal objects mm -hmm. so it plates plastic so it grows a plastic um, a metal substrate around this object itself which is which I thought again was a lovely lovely it's very high-tech technology and process driven for something that is that isn't about that. It was about your yeah. soul. It was about the heart. It was about the emotion. And I think that's how it sits. And there's a lovely symbiotic relationship between technology and craft in that point that you can keep them together as one. And for that piece, it kind of worked very well. Well, um, um, I, I, I loved ending, um, yeah, with both combining the tech technology in the heart i mean maybe before we we um wrap this up do you have do you want to share anything like about where your work is going now is there a, a new body work that we should be looking out for someday or i know you, you're shifting into like students and, and teaching as a, as a meaningful part of your practice um do you want to say anything yeah i oh my I, i've always taught i've taught at the same i've i've been a lecturer the exact same time i've had same period of time as i've, I've had a studio I believe in kind of any research I do drips straight back in. I work with the students. It's uh, they make me excited. It, it's yeah. they don't know that. They maybe think they make me angry, but they don't. Um, I mean, students her, hope for the future. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's important that that like I don't believe in in being a lecturer that keeps everything to myself. I want them to be able to try and challenge what I've done already and create and change and maybe make better, make different, in their own kind of creative language itself. Now I'm kind of, again, I'm working, I'm doing a bit of a, I, 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 I can describe it, but I can't, I don't know how it's gonna work yet. And that's important for me. If I know the end result of any project, I never start it. Because yeah. if I'm bored, you'll be bored. That's the way <laughs> I look at it. Well, so I'm looking, yeah. I'm looking well, at smoke. And I've completely put you on the spot. I recognize that. And um... no, no, I can I can tell you quickly. Uh, I'm I'm working. Uh, I'm trying to uh, recreate uh, Casablanca the movie, but do it. Um, but from the angle of only focusing on the cigarette smoke. So I'm mm -hmm. trying to look at the the use of smoking as a veiling for uh, gender, because in Class of blank, if you look at it, the when the females smoke, they use it for empowerment. When the males smoke, they use it for hiding. So I'm kind of interested in you can actually use smokers. So I'm trying to recreate an object. So the thing, there will be some physical 3D objects, but there's also going to hopefully be some sort of AR experience. So you can almost be a part of this new environment. How it works, and it's 
challenging wow. uh, is getting there. So there's lots of different things there. So we're looking at, again, it's challenging materials. It's this extended material library is what I like to create where um, smoke can be tangible, can be something physical and solid. And if you can actually watch how somebody speaks through it, it could be an audio piece yeah. of game, it could be movement, but actually, uh, yeah, so that's where we're looking at just now. That is fast. Well, okay, one, I'm going to be watching Casablanca tonight for Friday night movie <laughs> night. Um, but but also, yeah, that's so rich. I mean, never thinking of smoke as being the material, but, you know, just now, like, thinking through history, it's used so symbolically, like, the, well, the act of smoking or using smoke signals or you know, the Catholic Church, when a new pope is announced, it's done through smoke. Um, and yeah, how to capture that in an object. Okay, well, I will be staying tuned to see the Casablanca smoke work. Um, and um, I want to thank you again, Jeff, for, for being so generous with your time today uh, to speak with us at NOMA about um, our wonderful commission. And thank all of you um, for watching, um, for your support of NOMA, and um, encourage you to visit our website to look at this work and um, and all of the other interesting artists that we're featuring through our website. Um, so thank you so much, Jeff. I look forward to talking Hello. to you soon. Oh, thank you for your time.